to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 3. We welcome you today to our study of the beautiful book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with his apostleship. And really, in many ways, he is defending his apostleship from many naysayers who said that he was not a true apostle or that his motives were not pure. But along the way, as Paul speaks to these Corinthians, there are so many practical lessons that we're going to learn. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today, and we hope that you'll locate your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God together. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. They'd be glad to have you anytime. Uh, if you've got a Bible question or you'd like to study the Word of God further, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who love God, who are concerned about lost souls, and who want the Bible to be the final authority. And friend, we'd love to help you as well at The Gospel of Christ. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? From there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study materials. We have video lessons, audio lessons, transcripts, good study question material, just a, a wide variety of Bible study material, and it's all free, available to you from our website. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on 2 Corinthians or any of our lessons, we'd be happy to send those to you free of charge, or you can get them free immediately by downloading them from our website as well. And check out our app for both the iPhone and Android, available free from the various app stores. You can get those as well. And we just hope that you'll enjoy our study together today and that we'll be uplifted by the Word of God. As we mentioned, the book of 2 Corinthians is all about Paul dealing with and defending his apostleship. Paul will think of himself and often refer to himself as an apostle out of due season. That doesn't mean he wasn't a real apostle and there were some going around and trying to subvert the apostle Paul's authority and say that he wasn't a true apostle. And Paul will defend that. But as much as anything, Paul will offer encouragement and strength to the Corinthians as he writes this letter. Well, what is it exactly then that we're going to learn from a practical perspective about the book of 2 Corinthians? Here are the lessons we're going to learn today. We're going to learn from chapter 1 that God's church is unique and that the church belongs to God and that there is a proper description for it found in the Bible. Let me illustrate. Open your Bible, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and let's ask this question. When God refers to His church, what does He call it? Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother. Now notice, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Friend, when we think about the Lord's church, when we think about the church of the Bible, it's unique in that it doesn't wear man-made names. It doesn't wear names that we or descriptions that we don't find in the Bible. In fact, what we find the church being referred to in the Bible only brings honor to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why it's called the church of God. That idea of God carries with it belonging to. The Lord's church, the New Testament church, the church that men and women need to be a part of today, belongs to God and His Son and to them only. 
think of the words of Acts. Here's why it's that way. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul spoke to the elders in Ephesus, and he told them to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Who bought the church? Who paid the price for it? Who has the right for it to belong to them? A friend, we learn from Acts 20, verse 28, that our Lord purchased the church with His own blood. No man has the right to call it their church, to put their name up on it, or to have followers after them. That's contrary to 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13. And friend, because Jesus died for it and it belongs to Him, we need to call the church by names that we find in the Bible. For example, in Romans chapter 16, verse number 16, the Apostle Paul told the Romans to greet one another with a holy kiss. Listen to this now. The churches of Christ greet you. The churches of who? In the area of Rome, a large city, metropolitan area, there might be more than one congregation, but it was the churches of Christ. They all belonged to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friend, when you think about this, I want you to think of the words of Jesus as it goes all the way back to the building of the church. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked His disciples, Who do men say that I am? And he said, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets. But he said to Peter and the rest of the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood. Men didn't tell you that, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you're Peter, you're a small stone, you're a Petros, but on this Petra I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friend, I want to ask you this from that verse, coinciding with the words of 2 Corinthians 1 verse 1, to the church of God which is at Corinth, when the Lord said, I will build my church, I want to ask two very simple questions from that. Number one, who built the church? And number two, how many churches did Jesus say He would build? Jesus did not say, you're Peter, and on these rocks, I'll build my churches. No, on this foundation, I am the Messiah, the Son of God. I will build my church. There is but one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4, and we learn that the body is the church, Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. And so the church is unique in that it ought to belong to God and its description ought to give honor and glory to Almighty God as well. But you know, as we think about 2 Corinthians 1, in these initial verses, along with addressing and identifying who the church belongs to, we find such powerful and comforting words about the God that we serve. I want you to look in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4 with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Friend, there's two very powerful truths about the God that we serve that makes this such a, a powerful lesson is this. Paul describes God as the Father of mercies. Friend, God's mercy is when God allows us to escape what we do deserve. And we find throughout the Bible that our God is a merciful and loving God. 2 Peter 3 verse 9, The Lord's not slow concerning His promises, as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, merciful toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mercy and truth have kissed, the Bible says in Psalm 86 verse 15. They have combined and embraced the idea in the nature of who our God is. But then there's this idea. Along with being the Father of mercies, the God we serve is described as the God of all comfort. And it's such a unique play on words in verse 4. Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the same comfort that we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, that's a mouthful, but it simply says this. We serve a God who brings great comfort 
to us, His people, and He expects us to reciprocate that comfort that He offers us to others and to do good in our community and in our world. Friend, how encouraging it is to know that the God of all comfort is our God. Friend, when I think about the idea of comfort, all of us from time to time need comfort. When we lose a loved one, we want to and we need to be comforted. When difficult things happen in our life, we need that comfort and that consolation. And friend, the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as the Comforter. John 14, 16, John 16, verse 7, we know that Christ brought comfort. The Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and God Himself brings comfort to us. And friend, it's so encouraging to know that, that we can look to God in our time of help and need, and He will offer that help to each and every one of us. But friend, as we study these scriptures today, let's also notice from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, that, that, that our God not only brings comfort, but He's done everything possible to inform and teach us about His will. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Paul here says, we don't want you to be ignorant. And friend, the basic truth is, just as Paul didn't want them to be ignorant about the trouble they were facing, friend, we find throughout the Bible that God doesn't want His people to be ignorant. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 17, the Bible says, do not be ignorant but understand the will of the Lord. God has given us His Word so that we can know the truth. John chapter 8, verse 32, and the truth will make us free. And with that truth, 1 John 5, verse 13 tells us, there is great confidence. John says, these things we write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in His name. And so we have the comfort of knowing God's will, being informed of God and knowing the Scriptures. And friend, as I think about God and as Paul identifies Him in this context, one of the great attributes of our God is His absolute unwavering faithfulness. Look in your Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to notice verses 18 through 20 with me. The Bible says this, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached to you among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but was in Him yes. Now watch this. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, in Him are amen, to the glory of God through us. Friend, when I think about the quality of God that offers so much comfort and hope, it's that we serve a faithful, trustworthy God who is going to stand behind His promises. Uh, the Bible tells us this in 1 John 2, verse 25. This is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. And someone says, okay, that's good and well, but how does that relate to the faithfulness of God? Friend, God cannot lie. Titus 4, chapter 1, verse 2, it is impossible to, for God to lie. Hebrews 6, verse 18, and Malachi 3, verse 6 says, God cannot change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is the same past, present, future, yesterday, today, and forever. And so when I think about God, He is the rock. He is the epitome of faithfulness. He will never be moved. And as the Bible says, He will never leave us nor forsake us. Here's the point. So that we can boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 through 7. Now, in view of all of that, about God, about His nature, how does that uh, affect and help the Christian? Well, friend, because of these truths, the Christian can stand firm by his faith in God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 21 with me. The Bible says these words, Now he who establishes us with you is Christ, 
and has anointed us is God, who's also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts. Verse number 24, Paul says as well, by faith you stand. Friend, the, the, the promise, the establishment that we have and that by which we stand is faith in Almighty God. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Friend, as I study the Bible, as, I, as the, the, the truths of Scripture is confirmed, as I see it as the Word of God, and as I put my hope and trust in that, in who God is, friend, I can always take it to the bank. God's going to take care of every one of His children. Now, as we move to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we need for just a moment to back up to 1 Corinthians. As you're well aware, most likely, 2 Corinthians then is a follow-up to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, and chapter 2 especially is significant in the historical aspect of that. In 1 Corinthians 5, there was a man who had his father's wife. They, he was living in gross immorality, and Paul, along with the congregation, encouraged them to withdraw from that ungodly brother so that they might save his soul. It was a difficult thing to do, but 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1-4 through 4 shows just how much they loved that man. They followed through with what Paul said, and the wonderful news is that man in adultery, when they did what the Bible said about withdrawing from that man, that man in adultery got the point, he repented and was restored. But there was a problem. Some people were still holding a grudge against that man. Some people were still upset, no doubt, about the sin, how it likely affected the church, and how it brought great blemish on God's kingdom. Paul now writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, encouraging these Christians to bring that man back fully and to restore him and not to hold a grudge against him. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and I want you to see what Paul says beginning in verse number 8. In light of this event, Paul says, Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all these things. Now whom you forgive, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven the one who for, for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And so this man did good. He did what was right. And Paul says, since that's the case, I'm urging you, I'm, I'm pleading with you reaffirm your love to Him. Friend, what's great about being a Christian is we do get a second chance, and not just a second chance. If we'll repent and turn to God, friend, we're promised multiple. We don't want to take advantage of that, but when we sin, we can repent, and we have an advocate with the Father, and God will forgive us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And this man turned away from his sin. Paul says, don't make him a second-class citizen. Don't hold grudges against him. Don't look down your nose on him. I urge you, reaffirm your love to him. You ever known somebody who fall, fell into a, a pretty serious sin? Maybe that person got caught up in something grossly immoral. They turned from that and came back to God. How were they treated? Were they treated like they should have been? Did we wrap our arms around them? Did we bring them back into the fold? Did we do everything we can to encourage them? Or... Did we kind of think of them because of their sin as a little less of a person? Friend, may I remind each one of us of this. That person who fell into sin, I can put myself right in their shoes. Here's why. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 10 Romans 3, verse 23, Ezekiel 7, or Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20 said, There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. And so when we think about this idea, let's realize all of us have been where that man was, and we need to put ourselves in their shoes and to realize how thankful we are to God that He gave us a chance and that we ought to do that for others as well. Then as we move to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're reminded from this chapter that in doing things like this, in, in living the way we ought to, in representing God fairly, we may be the only Bible 
some people ever read. You ever thought about that? There are a lot of people who may never read their Bible, but they know you're a Christian. They know I'm a Christian. And did you think, ever think about the fact that we may be the only Bible some people ever read? Look at the beautiful words of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 3. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Paul says, you're an epistle. Your life is a, a, a living letter, in essence, he's saying, and is representative of what Christianity ought to be. Friend, I need to, I need to be cognizant of the fact that people are watching Christians, not in a bad way necessarily, but if someone knows you're a Christian, and they know you're trying to live by the Bible, you have an influence and an impression on them. Let's live in such a way. Paul is stressing here that, that our lives are a good epistle written and read by all men. Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And as we think about this idea, I'm reminded of the powerful example of Acts 4, verse 13. Peter and John had said some pretty bold things. They'd spoke plainly about Jesus. Uh, they spoke from the Scriptures to those who were supposed to be masters of the law. And they didn't realize how these uneducated and, 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 and smelly fishermen, in essence, could talk like this. And the Bible says this in Acts 4, 4 13. Then, it says the light bulb comes on, then they realized they had been with Jesus. Were people watching Peter and John and making an impression? Were they making an impression on them? Absolutely. And friend, my life and yours is the same way. Let's be careful how we live and let's count it a privilege that we can represent Christ. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the rest of the context will show the difference between the, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, how the Old Covenant was passing away, how it was temporary, how Moses' face was veiled, but in all of that, how the New Covenant is so much greater with Christians today. And Paul will say, uh, this treasure we have, it's our power, it's the power of God, and it's not in us, but it's in God Himself. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want you to notice verses 7 and 8. Paul says, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of God could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of His countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be, not be more glorious? And so his point is, yes, there was the old covenant, yes, it was a good covenant, but... Friend, what we've been given in Christ is so much better. The power of God has been revealed in God's people today, and we can put our trope, trust and our hope in Him in each and every way. But friend, as we think about this idea, let's then move into chapter 4. And friend, there are so many powerful lessons that we want to mention briefly from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and here are some of those. A Christian can't be the Lord's silent partner. Friend, the Lord doesn't have any silent partners today. If I obey the gospel, I ought to be excited and happy to tell others about Jesus. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Paul said, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I have believed, and therefore I spoke. Don't miss this. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Friend, do you believe in God? Do you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Do you believe there's a beautiful place called heaven? Do you believe there's a horrible place called hell? Do you believe that Christ is the only way to be saved? Friend, if we believe, what did Paul say? Paul said, we have believed. Therefore, what's the conclusion? Therefore, we speak. The Lord doesn't have any silent partners. If we really believe, what the Lord has done for us, and we are confident of our faith and the way of salvation, we've got to tell somebody about that. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. The love of Christ compels us to do just that. But friend, I want to, I want to close this idea today by noticing on what it is that makes telling that message 
so great, and it's this. We realize what we have in the here and now is temporary and that we're looking for something far greater. Look at the beautiful words that close this chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through 18. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. Why? Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What do you mean, Paul? Why do we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen? For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Friend, we're not looking forward to... Uh, a temporary home, an earthly home, a mansion here in this world. Our hope is not built on the here and now. Yes, we live in a fleshly body, and yes, we fight uh, a fleshly spiritual fight today against the uh, host of darkness, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. But friend, we eagerly groan. We look forward to it. We realize this is the temporary side. Friend, I hope you'll think real carefully about this with me. Everything right now is going to be here, but just for a moment. Paul, James says, what is your life? It's but a vapor. Appears for a little while, then it vanishes away. James 4, verse 14. This is the temporary side. This is the side, according to 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 12, that one day is going to be burned up in a fervent heat. If this is the temporary side, Let's not put our hope and our trust and all our affections and effort just into this world. Let's realize there's something greater awaiting the child of God. Friend, we ask you today, are you a Christian? Have you put your trust in the God of all comfort? Are you looking forward to that beautiful place called heaven? If you've never obeyed the gospel, why not do that today? Do you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? John 8, verse 24. Would you turn from sin and turn to God in repentance? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you do what Jesus said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. We're so glad that you joined us today. And we want to encourage you to listen again next week as we're going to study more from the wonderful book of 2 Corinthians. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work. Of... You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.